Hello, everyone. Uh, this time we have Jiří Kremzer, senior software engineer at Red Hat, uh, who works on the Hakilo project, talking to us something about reactive programming. Welcome. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? OK, so uh, today I will be talking about reactive programming. And the subtitle of my talk is Async Can Be Easy. So before I tackle the reactive programming, uh, let's look what the async actually is. What is asynchronous? So is this async? No, no, that, that, that's async. That's something different. So I like this definition that async is uh, multiple events and computations happening simultaneously. That doesn't necessarily mean that there should be some multithreading behind it. We are not going to talk about um, parallel programming and multi-training, nothing like that here. Because imagine JavaScript, there is just one event loop, and you can uh, still do kind of parallel things, which are kind of virtualized. So what asynchronous programming is as well, it is annoying. It's kind of hard to reason about the programs that are uh, doing multiple things at the same time. Because you don't read them from the top to the bottom, there are often there are places that, hap that are happening uh, that they call you. You know, it's it's kind of not like book that you read from left to right and from top to the bottom. It's more difficult. And what is also difficult that each each language, each framework has its own way how to deal with the asynchronous uh, events or asynchronous calls. Uh, I think the most uh, most well-known thing is the callbacks. Uh, it's basically that you will provide a parameter to a function that will be called after the function completes. But there are also things like promises or futures called in Java, listeners, and other stuff. What, is, what these concepts have in common that each concept covers only the part of the story. There is nothing uh, more general than, than that. So let's look into the, into the particular primitives. Uh, callback, as I, as I said, it's a parameter to a function. So if you call the get data function, it doesn't block the computation. The computation continues, and once it is done, the call me maybe callback is called. Uh, the different approach is to use a futures. You probably know that. Uh, that you can again call get data method, and you will you will get some kind of handler uh, to the future value that is not immediately there. But you have to wait for it. Uh, there are multiple Im implementations on future, of future. For instance, you can call get method on a future that will actually do the blocking call, and uh, you will wait in the program. Uh, oh, yeah. And today, the situation is that uh, the microservice architecture is quite common. So it's not, uh, it's not uncommon to, to end up with, with this state. Imagine you have a single REST API in which you call multiple uh, REST APIs, different one. So you can have future of list of futures because there are multiple calls. And yeah, of course, you, you can have the, the first version, the future of C of get data. But uh, in the last case, later case, you actually uh, say that you, you return the the the, the, the intermediate calls directly to the, to the user, and the user can handle them on its own way. You don't have to wait for all the calls to, to finish and then return the composed future. So how to deal with it? We've got observable. <laughs> it's, a, it's a concept from reactive programming that will tackle those problems. So where to find observables? You can use them in almost every language, and there is Rx libraries for them, so it's extension to the languages. I like this quote. That telling a program there is a library, it's like telling a songwriter there is a song about love, so everybody wants to write the library itself. So is this, is this, this situation what I'm talking about? You probably know this, this comics, but just read it. Yeah, let's hope it's not the case. So what is functional reactive programming? Here, 
there is a f word functional, but my talk is called reactive programming. Why functional? It's because the functional, uh, the reactive programming is quite a general concept. Uh, basically, the, each spreadsheet does the re reactive programming because for, imagine Excel, you've got the cell, and then you've got the dependent cell, and if you change the first cell, it will propagate the changes to the, all those dependent cells, and that basically the definition of reactive programming, the propagation of change and data flows and things like that. So here we'll be talking about functional reactive programming. And nowadays, it's basically represented by those three points, that there is something called observer and observable. So you can imag uh, imagine observer as a guy who observes event on observable. Actually, observable is pushing the events to observer. It's calling the events on observer. Observer is also called a subscriber. It's the similar stuff. There, are, there is also a lot of combinators. Those combinators can be called on the observable collection, and you can do pretty useful stuff with it. You, can, you probably know the, those operations for uh, as operations on collections that you can filter data, you can map data, reduce data, and things like that. It's basically relational algebra. But there are also combinators that deal with time aspects. We will talk, we will uh, look at it into more detail later. And the first aspect is the how, when, and where things are happening. These are kind of often represented by schedulers. We are not gonna talk about this because it's kind of implementation detail and it should be an interactive talk about reactive programming. So why the functional, I uh, basically covered that, but yeah, because it's cool to do a functional way. And there's a lot of economic background behind it. Uh, another, another reason is that it is good to, to know that the future observable, collection, optional, and others, they are all monads. Uh, it means that if you know that, you can work in them, with them in a kind of same way. There is also, uh, every time there is an operator in mathematical theory called bind, but often it is flat map in, in, in reality. And you can map those uh, observables, oh, sorry, those monads to, you can, you can combine them with another run and still stay in the monad. So for instance, it's heavily used in, in the future monad. In JavaScript, you can call then on a future. You know, you call a future, and then you can chain those future together with the, with the word then. So you have one future, then another future, then the third future, and it will end up in the one big future that is basically the chain of the three calls. That's possible because the then is actually the flat map. It's just the theory behind it. And if you, if you realize that, you can actually use something similar for optionals. You know, optional is the, is the object that encapsulates thing that might be there or might not be there. It's basically how we deal with null, null, null values. And you can actually flat map the optionals to kind of still stay in the optional state. It's like quantum state that you still don't know if it's there or not. Or not. But you can still uh, compute or process in no code later and later. Uh, another reason is that uh, pure functions uh, on observables, all the functions are pure. That means that there is, not all, but almost all, there are uh, functions that, have, that can have side, side effects, but most of them are pure. That means that if you call them over and over, it, it returns the same thing. And it is good to explicitly deal with side effects, what actually observables does. They, they, this, this type, it's, type uh, it's, it's written in pseudo Scala syntax, and it's basically what the get data method should, should look like, because it can throw an exception, that's, the try what, what, that's what the try does. The data might be there or might not be there, so that's why that optional is there. And it's not there immediately, so that's why the future is there. Uh, let's look to the landscape of the, of the programming, con, uh, programming data structures or patterns that are used for async programming. I like this slide because it's, I, I haven't looked, I haven't, I haven't thought about it problem in this way before I know the reactive programming. On the x-axis you have the quantity, if you are dealing with single value or multiple values, 
And on the y-axis, you've got uh, if it is a pull model or push model, or if it is a synchronous or asynchronous world. So objects, not just simple, simple, simple stuff. You can call method on it. Uh, if you have more objects, you basically end up with iterable or collection or some array in other languages. And if you want the one thing, but you don't have it r right now, you can use the future or promise. I think it's called task in Python. But if you have more things than one, and you've got, you, don't know, you don't have them right now, the observable is the, is the right thing to use. So let's look into the observable. So what is observable? It represents push-based collections. Yeah, it's not a very useful definition. It can be combined with other observables. It doesn't say much either. It's monad, we tackle that. I like this definition. It's any number of values over any amount of time. It's quite intuitive. And I like this, this thing. So you can imagine as a stream of events, some data. So once again, difference between iterable and observable. Uh, the iterable, it is uh, uh, the consumer who calls the methods on the, on the collection. If the consumer wants a next value, he calls the next on the, on the collection and he, he gets the value. Uh, it can throw us an exception and then it can return if there is nothing. You know, it's normal blocking stuff. On the other hand, you've got observable, where the producer actually, actually calls the method on consumer. So the, the, this met, these three methods are quite important because that's how the observable communicates with the observer, and it's how he say to observer, I've got new value. So if I've got new event of new value, I'll call on next on observer or on subscriber. If I've got error, I'll call on error. If, uh, if there is no more elements in the, in the stream, I will call on completed and the stream is kind of finished. So, and, and there is a grammar uh, that can be used for, uh, for kind of all the streams. So there can be an arbitrary number of, of, of the events, that's so arbitrary. Many times you can call the on onvex method, and then you can or can or don't have to uh, call the on error or on completed. So you know, these are kind of happy paths. There can be infinite stream. There can be stream with three members and then on completed, or it can be stream with four members and then there is error. Uh, it is kind of memory effectiveness effective because. Uh, what is happening in the collections? If you, you, you probably know those operators like map, filter, and I don't know, reduce and zip. These are well-known functions, I think, in all languages. But uh, normally, if you call the map, for instance, it will create an intermediate collection, which needs to be garbage collected, depending on the language. If it is garbage, it has garbage collector or not. But in observable, it doesn't create anything, uh, some intermediate results. It just uh, sets the plumps, you know, the plumbing. And then if, you, uh, if some subscribes to the observable, the things start happening. So, so the fir first piece of code, if you run this, it actually does the stuff. But the second, it actually sets up uh, infrastructure and does, does nothing. The, obser the observer should uh, have to subscribe, and then things will start happening. And they, they are happening in a way that it's kind of hot potato prote uh, processing. Because you've got an event, and you apply the flat map function on it, and the map function on it, and filter function on it. It's not like you iterate through all the events, because it's not even possible, because the stream can be infinite. It's like one by one processing. So how can we create observables? There are factories method for it. So for instance, the just method is pretty simple. You just provide a various number of parameters into, into that method, and you will end up with observables with those elements. But there is no time aspect in it. It's just they happen at the same time immediately. Uh, there, are, there, are, there are factories for dealing with time, like interval or timer. For instance, the interval, you provide a time period and time unit and it will create a new number after each time, time period. It doesn't look very useful, but you can combine those observable to a more complex one, so it can make, make, make sense with 
decomposing with another one. As I said, there are many, many combinators on observable. Uh, here I explicitly uh, say the type of the map and flat map, uh, because the flat map, as I said, is kind of a good operator in this uh, functional world. It is because, you know, you probably know the map. It's the, the, the simple function with the individual uh, exit uh, function, and it's called on a collection or an observable, and it applies the function on all the members of the observable. Uh, but what flat map does is it is more stronger because it's, it's a calling a map and then flatten the, the structure. So the flat map takes the function, which, the, which is going from the type of the events to another observable. So we are quite nesting into, uh, if we would call the same function on a map, not flat map, we would end up with observable of observable of R. But we don't know, we don't, we don't want that. We just want to flatten this, the, the thing to be able to just call the, the, the next method on, on observable. You know, it's, it's the flow API, like you want to uh, call a method on it, you kind of massage the, 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 the content and you want to call the next function on it, like filter. So you don't want to be nesting deeper and deeper. Uh, yeah, there are more of them, zip, merge, concat, group, by, sample. For instance, the sample is, 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 is lossy compression. You can have multiple events, and the sample actually takes another stream, and it creates a new stream, which will have events uh, only on those positions where the parameter of the sample uh, have some data. So, so it's this, the parameter of sample is completely uh, ignored. It serves only for kind of signaling that I, here take the data from the first stream, here take the data from the first stream, as, and, and so on. I will have demo, so we will demonstrate the sample method at the, at the end. Uh, yeah, so this is something called a marble diagram. It is a thing that visualizes actually the operators. It's uh, much better than describing it by words because you probably know that it's difficult. I probably didn't explain the, the sample operator well, so let's look into the sample operator, for instance, if it is there. Sample. Okay, it's not there. Oh, here it is. Uh, so, so this is the stream on which we call the sample, and this is the parameter of the, of the sample method. So if it ignores the events from the second stream and takes the, first, takes the events from the first stream on the positions where there are some data uh, in, the, in the second stream. It is nice that you can, you can uh, change the order of the, of, the, of, the, of the input and see the result. OK, so uh, there is uh, something called hot and versus cold distinction in, in, in observables. By default, all the observables are cold. That doesn't, this means that they are lazy, that if no, no one subscribes, they doesn't do anything. After first subscription, they will do this, actually the stuff, they will process the events and so on. On the other hand, we have, we've got whole observables, which are kind of a queues or something like broadcasting stuff, and they doesn't care about subscribers, then they just produce data and you can subscribe on them, and you will actually miss the data. You, you can subscribe at the middle of the stream, while at the first, first time, every time you subscribe, you actually replay all the events for you. The, the frame will replace all the events for you. So it's something like this smart thing. <laughs> if you don't subscribe to call observable, nothing happens. All right, so, so let's look at some code. All right, I've got a simple, uh, simple demo that will, oops, that should demonstrate uh, how, how observables can be useful. So here, is it is visible? I think it is more than, so I've got a URL and I will be calling get functions to uh, stocks. So I've got also HTTP client, OK HTTP client, so this is the guy who will, 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 do, the, the, will do the get calls. So I've got the fetch, fetch method that, that is actually doing the blocking, blocking call. 
So this this dot execute is a blocking call. It do the it does the get request and waits until the response uh, go back to the to the client and then it processes the the response. So it will take some it will pass the JSON and take the value of the stock that is provided as a parameter as a code. Nothing fancy here. I've got second. So yeah, let's let's run the code. Here is the simulation. So I'm creating an observable by the dot create a method that is a factory method that actually creates the observable. So it takes a parameter as a as a it takes a sub subscriber as a parameter because as you know the observable is calling stuff on subscribers, so it needs the subscriber on which it can call the on next on or error error or completed method. And I'm just using the infinite loop that from the, these codes, it will map them to a stock fetcher fetch. So instead of each particular string, there will be actually the stock value uh, instance. I haven't, there is also stock value, but this, this is just a code and a value of the stock. And for each, uh, for each of those stock values, it will call the onNext method on observer. So this is the observer that, that will have events from, from the ticks like uh, in, in the stock. And then we will subscribe to it and, and print it out. We can actually do that right here, but. Okay, so, so run it. Yeah, it takes stocks despite the poor connection here, cool. And I've got also second method right here, Ouch. which is called uh, fetch async. But what it actually does, what I want to show here, is that you can wrap a, a code into an observable, but th this time I will call the, the NQ method on, on, the, on the client. That's the asynchronous way to to, to, do the, to perform the HTTP calls. So at the first, first example, we use the ex execute. Right now, we use the ex ex NQ. But this, the, the signature of the method is that it accepts the callback. So it basically is the old way of doing stuff via, via, via callbacks. So here I am uh, showing how we can wrap the async code that uses callbacks into an observable. So as you may notice, it will, it will return an observable of stock, of stock values. And once the callback is finished, it's just called on next on subscriber. Again, nothing fancy here. But it should be faster because right now it, does, it performs a lot of calls because they don't wait to each other. And then the, it grabs the results and uh, send it to a system out. So, okay, so let's run the simulation number two. Yeah, it's, it's much faster. Right, so it can, use be, it can be used for like server side calls, but at the, at the end of the session, I will show you another demo how to use it for a UI. Uh, Rx is everywhere. It's not language agnostic model, as I told. Here are examples of the same stuff. So we are creating an observable and interval on it. So it's, as I described, it's a, it's a factory method that creates an, an events, uh, and after each second, it will create a new number. That's, that's it. And this is just the syntax difference, but it's the, basically the same across all languages on top of JVM. But here is also a slide for non-JVM languages like .NET, C++, C++, Python, and so on. So as you can see, the syntax is different, but the, uh, the, 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 the essentially it's the same. Every time we subscribe to an observer, here probably the C++ is the most different code, but it's still the same. It's called the interval, one second, and subscribe. You know? And there are implementations in almost all languages. It can be used on, even for mobile development, Haskell, Dart, PHP. So find your favorite language and use that. Uh, it will be used in Angular 2.x, 
is the UI framework for uh, creating web applications. Uh, it should be part of the ExmaScript 7, so it will be in the JavaScript itself. There is an initiative called Reactive Streams that it doesn't actually cope with the API, but it, feel, it deals with the back pressure. It's something, um, for instance, the consumer uh, don't have to be as fast as the producer, then you have to deal with back pressure. So we've got more events on the server side or on the observer, and then you are able to consume. You have to somehow buffer them, so this framework kind of tries to solve it. Solve it. It is, the WebSockets is pretty pretty good fit for this architecture because uh, for normal request and response, you basically create an observer with just one event. It doesn't make sense. Okay, then you can create a more complex observable to, to uh, kind of merge those events into one, one big observable. But still, uh, WebSockets, it's kind of natural fit for, for observables. That's why it's, uh, it has great support in rx.js. That's the reactive extension library for JavaScript. You just call WebSocket and place the URL and then you have end up with observable and you can filter, for instance, the topic with in, in what you are interested in. And, or you can group by that by topic that actually creates a multi, multiple observers grouped by a topic. So it's kind of multiplexing one WebSocket connection for multiple purposes because uh, WebSockets are quite expensive, expensive resources. It's good to uh, have open them as less as possible so you can kind of piggyback multiple communications on one channel. Right, so uh, let's, let's do a second demo about a UI and I will show you that everything is a stream, that there are things that you haven't probably thought about it in this way but there are streams. So here is the code, but I will open it in, in a browser. So it's a live JavaScript editor. The CSS is not, is not important, it's just how it looks like. HTML, there are just a couple of divs with IDs, nothing fancy. Let's close it. So what it does, it's just, uh, it's, it's doing drag and drop for, a, for an element. And it is interesting how it does. So we are using the RxJS library. And first time we'll obtain the element. And then we are creating a streams of events. And this is the concept from RxJS library. It doesn't make sense in different languages that can, can work with DOM, DOM elements. But here, if, if I provide a DOM element and then JavaScript event, I've got a stream of those events from this particular element. So mouse down is a, actually if I press a button on box, this will emit an event. Similar stuff for mouse up. If I release the mouse button, it will create an event. Mouse move, if I move on the whole document, it, it's, it's continually creating events. So how can I uh, program or how can I get the most drag events? Again, flat map. So we are using mouse down as an input for, for the mouse drag events. So every time the user press or you know, uh, pushes the button on the box element, it, does, uh, it maps all those, those events into mouse moves. So instead of this one click, I've got multiple mouse moves. And I take them until the button is released. That's the, interesting, that's the important stuff. So mouse down, I take all the mouse moves un until the mouse up is, until the mouse is released. And here it is implementation details. I'll just want to uh, know how much it was uh, moved. You know, if I press the button and go to other place and release, I want to know the delta of X and delta of Y. So at the beginning I will store information where it was clicked and then I will calculate the, the delta of the mouse drop, sorry, the mouse up and mouse down event. Yeah. All right, so we can continue. We can have an event stream called side, which is basically, we'll take all, all those uh, mouse drag events 
So if I'm dragging the, the button, it will, it's just emitting the, the events, and I'm mapping them uh, to a function that will return either light or dark, depending if it is on the left half of the screen or on the right hand side of the screen. And I, if I didn't use this operator, it will emit um, a lot of those, those events. I'm just interested about the change. So if there is, uh, I don't know, 100, uh, okay, 100 events calling left side, I'm just, um, I just want one of them. So this, this operator will kind of compress the stream and I'm remove the duplicities, basically. And in other events, I will uh, be notified if this, it is dropped on it, on which side it is dropped. So if I show the console, okay, <laughs> and then uh, zoom out, I can see that if I cr cross the half of the screen, it is changing the events, and if I drop it on some place, it will produce a drop event. It's not interesting, but, uh, so, sorry, it's not useful, but it is interesting to, to see that it, it can be used for creating UI. For instance, in the Angular, uh, all those, uh, currently, you, you, you have to use the watch event, watch on some, on some uh, variables, and it is handled by callbacks, but the same thing can be done in observables. Okay, so let's go to the presentation. How to test that? It looks like there is a lot of magic in it and uh, it's not obvious what is happening there. But I like, I like it, it is actually a real test coming from the RxJS library again. It is actually an ASCII, ASCII test. There is a, you know, ASCII de definition what to test. We create a hot, hot, observer, hot observable there will be a couple of events. The subscriber will subscribe at this place, and we will use the isPrime function uh, for filtering the events. So all, only the primes will stay in the stream. So as you may see, expected, result, expected stream should, should look like that. And then, yeah, just comparing the stuff. If you don't, be, don't believe me, you can see this real code in, in their code base. Uh, how mature is that? It's pretty old technology, actually. It's not new, but there is a hype around it right now. Uh, it's pretty solid. Netflix is the most proponent of the technology. They use it for, um, as, uh, for the front end as well as the back end. GitHub used that. A couple of Red Hat products. This is our project, Hocular. Not sure about Wildflies forum, but I heard something. Vertex is definitely use that, using that. So just a quick recap. Uh, observable are any number of values over any amount of time. That's an important thing to know. Rx can be used for UI as well as on the server side. Uh, it's not just an asynchronous call to a server side. Actually, the UI part is, uh, is what is, makes more sense to me right now because it, uh, for instance, the RackJS is the second favorite, or this, perhaps it is the largest hype right now. It uses the reactive architecture as well. They, use, they call it Flux, but it has the same concept as reactive programming. Uh, can be done in another language. It's not language agnostic. And called observables are lazy. Until, until you subscribe, nothing will happen. If you want to learn more, I suggest uh, there's a course on Coursera uh, given by Eric Mayer, which is kind of uh, one of the leader, leaders of this reactive, reactive stuff. There is also a thing called Reactive Manifesto, which tries to uh, formalize or uh, define what, what the reactive is because uh, every, every, it's a heavily overloaded term and I, I hear that all, all the time that we are reactive and what does it mean to be reactive. So they try to say what, to, what does it mean to be reactive. And there is also a course, online course, in, in which you can 
uh, interactively learn Rx. You start with simple examples, and you go further and learn more and more. Right, so my message here is if you have a uh, library or project and it does make sense for you to, uh, to expose the stuff in an observable way, do it right now. Because it's uh, easier for, con for consumers of the API to use the observable, uh, observable operators and reactive streams. Thank you for your attention. Now, any questions? We've got swag here. Okay. Really nothing? Okay. okay. Thank uh -huh. yeah. okay. okay. Thank you. Just a quick announcement. If you don't have a ticket to the party tonight, there are still a few tickets in the, uh, at the Red Hat booth. And if you're a volunteer or speaker and you don't want to come to the party, please uh, go there and, and let them know so they can give the ticket to somebody else.